thank you for downloading this podcast from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number three, five, four. Hello and welcome back to the Outdoor Station and of course a very happy new year. Here's to a bright, positive and cheerful 2013 for us all. Now as 2012 drew to a close, I found myself reassessing various aspects of my business at backpackinglight.co.uk and of course the outdoorstation.co.uk. Moving into our eighth year of trading, still with a keen interest and leaning towards lightweight self-powered travel, it's been interesting to see how the commercial and the consumer landscape has settled down after the heady, exciting new lightweight revolution which went viral around the outdoors world starting probably around the early 2000s. This was, of course, laid at the feet of the lightweight US evangelist Ray Jardine, and we can all thank him for making us start to question what we carry and why. However, about a year ago, there was a fly in the lightweight ointment. Ryan Jordan from the forum backpackinglight.com posted an article entitled Cottage Stagnation and Recent Gems, where he indulged us all with his thoughts about the total lack of innovation in the cottage gear market and that the ultralight market is poised for doom at the hands of the established manufacturers. Now, what you have to keep in mind, of course, is Ryan's past history in fanning the embers of controversy into glorious colourful flames and then standing back. Of course, the original article is now hidden behind the backpackinglight.com firewall. And if you want to read it for yourself, I'm afraid you're going to have to pay Ryan the privilege to do so. However, it did what I'm sure he intended, and over the last 12 months, it's kicked off a huge volume of articles, debates and blogs about the subject and about the article from many of the well-known online enthusiasts. And these include Henrik from Finland, Martin Rye at Summit and Valley blog, Chris Townsend at christownsend.com, Andrew Skirka, stupid light he'd called it, over at andrewskirka.com, Andy Howell, of course, at andyhowell.com, and links to all these and more can be found on theoutdoorstation.co.uk. The most detailed and elaborate article was an eight-pager written by Ron Moak of Six Moon Designs, entitled Ultralight, The State of the Revolution. So, in this next series of podcasts, I thought I would reconnect with some of the better-known, still-standing individuals in the lightweight arena and hear their thoughts on the recent past, present and future of lightweight gear. Henry Shires, Glenn Van Pesky, and in this two-part interview, the author of Ultralight, The State of the Revolution, Ron Moak from Six Moon Designs. Okay, well, let's start with the with the article then, because I know it uh, it, gen- it generated a lot of interest when you you wrote it. I noticed you published it on Friday the thirteenth. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Uh, uh, no, I didn't realise that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in January, Friday the thirteenth, two thousand and twelve, you posted an article uh, on your blog there about the uh, ultralight, the state of the uh, the revolution, referring to an article that uh, Ryan Jordan had um, had kicked off. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering now, to almost 12 months on, here we are just going into 2013. Um, the article um, does delve into uh, a lot of thoughts on the actual ultralight revolution and where it's, how it's developed to where it is when you wrote the article. I'm just wondering, as, as things have moved on 12 months now, the type of feedback that you've had uh, in relation to that article and if your thoughts have changed in any way at all. Um, actually, they haven't. They've become actually more reinforced over the last year. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the directions we're moving, um, there's been some recent discussions uh, noticed on the web about, you know, is ultralight dead? Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into the whole life or death of ultralight. My, my tagline these days essentially is, you know, 
Um, and it's kind of an odd, odd thing is essentially ultralight is will be successful when it becomes meaningless. Um, and I think that that is, um, it's, it's, it's a little harder to wrap your head around it. It's basically, you know, the goal for, 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 for people like us who are in the production of the uh, gear is to, is to take the techniques, you know, um, uh, or take our knowledge, you know, in terms of how to, to travel light and move them into a wider audience um, without having to necessarily, you know, um, gain a lot of the old expertise of ultralight, you know, backpacking with tarps and things like that. And a lot of that's actually happened. You know, the ultralight, you know, you can buy tents now that weigh as much as an old tarp and bivy sack um, that let you sleep anywhere you want to sleep, you know. Clothes have gone ultralight, you know, in the last four or five years, pretty much. Um, the whole market has essentially gone that direction, you know, um, to allow people to do essentially what they could do, you know, what with the traditional gear with a lot less weight. Do you think, do you think, um, well, certainly the internet has obviously revolutionized the revolution in many respects. Uh, mm -hmm. that the fact that the small cottage industries that sort of took um, Ray Jardine's uh, original um, ideas and, and passion and obviously mm -hmm. uh, developed their own range of, of items, some of which turned into commercial adventures and some of which were, were just purely for pleasure. Um, right. But the, the internet certainly has been a key part of anything you'd associate with a revolution, hasn't it? Well, without the internet, I don't think the movement could have actually gone anywhere. It required that, you know, um, it required a pretty intimate feedback between the designers and the and the um, customer, you know. And, and if you look at a lot of designs, you know, in the early years, um, every time you created a product and you, you know, you make a hundred of them or whatnot and you send them out in the world and you get people call you back up and say, I like this, I didn't like that, and you'd be tweaking them constantly. You know, every release of that particular product would be tweaked. Um, and you need that feedback, you know, basically to gain the expertise because most of us who started this, you know, didn't come out of the design world. You know, we didn't come out of the established, you know, sports world of, of backpacks. We came basically as users. So we had to, you know, do a couple of things at one time. One is you had to learn how to create a business. And at the same time, you had to learn how to design. And, you know, both of those require a lot of, you know, interactions with, you know, with the end user. Um, and I think that over the years, you know, that's stabilized as, as, you know, as you get better at your designs, you don't have to go back there and tweak them every, you know, every iteration because you're better off you know, you're learning, you know, how to design up front without having to make, you know, radical changes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose in some respects, when you actually sort of step back from it, it, it has gone full circle. Because if you go back to the, oh, I suppose after the war, really, sort of the 1950s into the 1960s, any sort of outdoor equipment that was available then um, mm -hmm. was made uh, predominantly by people who were fairly hands-on. The people, right. you know, the, the nations around the world were much more practical and hands-on. Most people would make their own clothes and they would make mm -hmm. their own equipment and, and hardware. So um, I suppose they they took on some of the military aspects of, of what was left over from the war in its various formats. Um, and the people who were actually out doing activities would make the equipment they needed. Then I suppose going into what the seventies, seventies, eighties, the designers and the marketing team teams got involved, and of course they were thinking and and working in a much grander and larger scale, which then meant production was ramped up, and of course all of a sudden the local um, production uh, system couldn't cope with the demands that the marketing uh, world was creating, uh, and it was outsourced, obviously outsourced to Asia. Yeah. Um, and here we are now, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I look at the ultralight revolution as such as just the fact that that people's eyes have been open to the fact that they were carrying much more than they actually needed. And they mm -hmm. were able to start questioning everything. 
And I think we as consumers at that particular time, living through the 70s and 80s, were just getting very, very excited about looking like you're going to climb the north face of, uh, of Everest. In actual fact, you were just going for a country walk and it, you just didn't need to. Right. If you look back, you know, at the early 70s, there were very few, you know, backpacking stores in the U.S. You know, um, I lived on the East Coast and I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 1977 and there was... You know, and there was one backpacking store, you know, available when I was outfitting myself to go shop or go for the trail. I had to go through places like um, REI catalogs and L.L. Bean catalogs and EMS catalogs and things like that to buy all my equipment Um, because there just really wasn't a wide variety of stores. And even back then, you know, some of the big brands we consider now, you know – weren't what you would call what they are today. You know, Western uh, Western Mountaineering didn't exist. Sierra Designs was a much smaller company. You know, it took a long time for them to grow. And in a way, the cottage gear guy is about like that too, you know. so But we're already – we're bump, bumping up ahead, up our heads against this, you know, um, long-established group of people like Kelty and Sierra Designs and whatnot. And the question is whether or not – for many people, as well or not, um, one will the cottage gear, you know, grow to that extent, or will the larger companies essentially adopt our style and wipe us out that way, either buy us up or just adopt our, you know, style of, of designing gear, and then take over the market that way. Mm, I mean, that's, that's that's quite a good point. I mean, I was, certainly at the um, the European Trade Fair this year, there was I noticed there was a lot of equipment and a lot of clothing that had had, had the name lightweight stamped somewhere mm-hmm. on its marketing presence or on its right. on, on the product itself. It wasn't necessarily um, what we would class as practical from a purist's point of view, being on the lightweight, right. ultra ultra lightweight. But it did show that the the bigger brands had actually taken on board the fact that there was a significant interest in things that are lightweight and even though perhaps the end consumer was not fully educated as regards the different levels they were being persuaded to look at that particular product because of the um, of the title associated with it yeah well i mean even five years ago an ultralight tent on from a major manufacturer was a still four and a half pound tent mm, mm. you know and that when they would label it ultralight and you, you pick up the weight and it's four and a half pounds but nowadays you know you can now buy a big agnes tent you know and the um three pound range or lighter you know um because they've also gone to lighter fabrics and things like that so you know first first is the labeling and then and, and then finally you get to follow up with the actual goods that you know start to impress but people like, you know, Mont Bell have created ultralight, you know, um, clothes for the last five or six years or longer, actually. You know, I used, you know, Mont Bell um, cl- clothes, you know, when I was on the TGO last year and had no problem. Um, and I used a combination of Mont Bell and, and uh, Mountain Hardware jackets and Mont Bell um, pants. Um, and that was one of the coldest TGOs, and I was perfectly comfortable. You're listening to the Outdoor Station. Co. UK, award-winning producers of podcasts to inform, inspire and entertain lovers of the great outdoors everywhere. Was that the first time you'd walked in Scotland? Yes, it is. The first time I've been to Scotland. So, so, so you must have had very strong reflections and, and, and comparisons that um, you were absorbing as you were looking at other people's gear and what they were doing and how they were using it. And also from from the US perspective, uh, what um, what would you tell me about that? What what, are you, what were your thoughts when you returned home? Well, a lot of people, you know, I, I think that you know, we're all 
you know, conditioned by our localities, you know. So what I carried in 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 the U.S. as is essentially what I would normally carry, or I mean, what I normally carry in the U.S. what I took with me over there, and I didn't have to make many changes except I did end up buying a fleece jacket because I'm, down doesn't work very well in a wet environment, as you probably know. And and normally in most cases I don't walk all day in 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 um, in rain and snow, but there was a couple of days in there where that, where that was the case. So I went and bought a fleece jacket to so I could carry it and wear it all day long. But I think that most people, you know, were thinking that the Scottish weather was the worst you know they've ever seen, um, but. I think it's a matter of perspective. I've certainly seen, you know, I've certainly hiked in worse weather than I had in Scotland. Um, and a lot of people, you know, thinking that the weather is so bad is reflected in the amount of gear they carry. You know, a lot of local, plus the fact that a lot of the people are older, so they tend to, tend to carry what they carried, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and there was a lot of people carrying, you know, heavyweight packs. You know, my pack was, you know, fully loaded with food and water and, you know, was probably never more than 15 pounds. So it's certainly easier, fairly easy to do the TGO on a with light pack um, and not feel uncomfortable about it. Um, but I live also in the Northwest and we also get, you know, our fair share of rain and snow yeah. here too, so... Yeah, I think uh, probably to be to be fair to having walked done the TGO myself and in similar conditions the previous year, um, I think the most disheartening part is is not necessarily complaining about the weather because you you know you expect it to a certain extent. It's just the fact that actually this is probably your only two week holiday that you're you're able to get, and there's nothing more miserable than walking in rain continually for two weeks when it's supposed to be a holiday. Um, yeah, as as much yeah. as it's also the challenge and the and the um, you know environment as well and. Um, the the meeting and greeting old friends. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But there was nothing then that you came away with that you sort of felt was um, something you've uh, you know absorbed into your design or your thoughts of, in your portfolio. Yeah, we have. I mean, and and we're and the part of what we're working on now, which will be um, is still in wraps. Where we hope to make a major announcement um, at the end of January. Um, so I'd like to, you know. Tell you more about it right now, but unfortunately, we're still, you know, keeping things pretty close to, um, to the vest, so to speak. Um, and it is reflected a lot with, you know, um, some of my experiences over there in terms of of, of looking at at you know advances in gear. And I think that you know the whole concept of the death of innovation in ultralight gear is a myth because um, we've certainly, you know. <laughs> Taking it to heart, I think what you'll see from us, you know, coming out over the next year will probably, you know, make people rethink, you know, what is possible um, with lightweight gear. Um, and so, yeah, we're, you know, we're we took the um, the message from the TGO to heart, you know, and I'm and trying to figure out how to create, you know, gear that appeals to that kind of a hiker um this is still lightweight um and extremely comfortable and gives them the same sort of comfort that they have now with their existing gear but you know the ways you know half or less of what they currently carry them mm. i mean that, that is a, a point coming back to something you said earlier on as well and, and you're just reinforcing it that uh because you're a small company, and like most small companies, um, Henry Shires and obviously Glenn Van Pesky, you know, you you guys get out and and do things in various places around the world, and and bring that back to the design table. The thing yeah. about the the, I suppose, and not trying to be unkind, but sort of semi-critical, I suppose, the the Chinese development and the Chinese manufacturing process, um, you don't get the feeling that the actual designers are as hands-on as regards using the equipment in in the same way as you you just described the TGO and at the same time um you don't also uh, as you just said previously you know the time taken for them to come up with something design it prototype it play with it uh, develop it give it to people to think about and then get it actually into development is considerably longer uh, i mean i'm i'm currently here we are going into 
um, into Christmas at the end of 2012 and on my the shop that I run, you know, I'm having people asking me about my orders for next Christmas because right. they've got to get the orders over to China to develop the to produce the goods and or wherever they're having them manufactured. You know, that's the, that's the lead time they're working to. And I think looking at your article and, and some of the things that were said and also uh, some of the things that Ryan said, I think the innovation, he, he, he obviously approached it from a, his, his own point of view. But my, my thoughts would be, I think the innovation is still there. It's just that now we're getting much more connected with each other through the Internet and Facebook and social media. Then we're much more immediate uh, about our expectations for developing equipment, what, what's coming next. And I think the, um, you know, it's the, the passion that people feel for small companies like your own and uh, sort of cottage industries is the fact that they do feel part of that development process. And in actual fact, the comments they make or suggestions they make, they might see, as you've just described, now you're working on something now that's going to be released in, you know, beginning of next year. That's fantastic turnaround. You know, what a... What well, a, actually, what it'll a actually way. be... We'll, we do an announcement earlier, but... But we're caught in the same thing that, you know, other people are caught in terms of, of lead times because this is a product that's more complex to build. So it's going to be have to be built over seas. Um, and so because of that, it's going to be, you know, our announcement and our and our uh, delivery will probably be months apart. Um, but we think this is an important enough announcement that, that people will want to know. That it gets back to essentially, I think that you know, if I had to say, what are three things that are, you know, dictating the the, the cottage gear? Okay, there's different f- fractions of cottage gear, as we all know. I mean, there's different classifications in terms of where you fit in the continuum of ultralight gear. And and from my perspective, where we are, the tier we're at, we're sort of like the, the more the mainstream. And there's there's three different things that we're shooting for. One is and I think that this would be, you know, true for you know um, others too. Is you know durability, um, and these are things that will, you know, how how well you can grow into the into the you know into the larger market. Um, durability is one, availability, and then price. And those are the three things that that basically distinguish you know whether you can move into a larger market or you're still a state in a niche market um, from a from a small you know we can go into a small store you know a retail shop and say you know probably like yourselves or like some of the other ones who who's who are looking for differentiation and sell a product but if you want to get into a larger market like an REI or an EMS or you know a larger chain they're looking for, you know, they want durable goods, which has not been the hallmark of ultralight. They want availability of goods, which means that they order it, they have a reasonable expectation of getting it. The last thing they want to do is order something, you know, and then only discover that there's no production behind that. And then they want a reasonable price, you know, uh, pretty good margins and markup. Um, so those are the and those are the, th- the three things that are the hardest for, you know, the ultralight community to sort of grapple with, you mm-hmm. know, because they've got to, you know, increase their production capability, which means there's more risk. You know, they got to increase the durability of their product, which generally, you know, has always meant, you know, w- more weight, you know. Um, so, and... And most, you know, cottage gear people are not the best business people, so they don't really think in terms of margins and retail and things like that. You know, it's difficult for them to wrap their head around that whole um, thing. So, which is why you don't see a whole lot of of uh, cottage gear people, you know, in shops. Yeah, you know. I mean, I, I, um, I mean, that's the, that certainly the that was the reason Golight took off so rapidly is that their background before they came into the industry was much more financial based, and mm-hmm. they were much more commercial people. I think with with that sort of attitude, and um, it's interesting to see how that suddenly uh, blossomed and then sort of withdrew slightly, to say to say the least. Did you <laughs> did you um, agonise at all about having splitting your production between um, overseas and Asia and the U, the US? I agonize it almost on a daily basis, you know, 
um, in terms of what I'm doing there versus what I'm doing here. Um, and I, you know, but I, I haven't cut anything off in the, in the U.S. I shouldn't, I should note that is that, you know, we are still, you know, over, we're producing to our capacity in the U.S. So anything I do in Asia is simply, you know, uh, reflects the fact that, um, I can't get what I need to get done to serve the market, you know, with U.S. production only. So if I go into the United States, my facility in the United States, and say I need to get the quantities that I need to get, you know, it just, it overwhelmed them. Right. Um, so I had no choice, essentially, if I was going to keep the keep the volume and up and uh, and also keep the quality. Because the, the biggest problem with, with U.S. production and this is true from a lot of people, is that there's a lot of rework that's been done. Or, you know, one is, is it, we call it, you know, shelf-ready goods. And it's kind of a technical thing, but, you know, a lot of times when you when you order something from the United States, um, it doesn't come, you know, ready to ship. It comes done, but you're, you're trying to keep the cost down as much as possible. So... To do that, you accept goods that are, you know, may not have all the assembly work done, may not have all the, you know, the guidelines tied on, you know, may not be all finished packaging and whatnot. So you get that in, and then you do that as the add-on. So, you know, you can keep that, that the assembly cost, you know, the, the production cost down a little bit, the sewing point of view, and then in-house you bring it in, and then you do the final, you know, assembly stages. And if you're starting, you know, if you're doing a hundred units, that's one thing. But if you're if you're ordering a thousand units, you know, then it starts to get real pricey. And then oftentimes in the U.S. production, the quality control isn't there. You know, you have to go to a place that sell that that produces, you know, tens of thousands of of items a month to find a place that has built in the quality control to handle that. You know, most small shops in the United States don't have that layer, those layers of quality control. It's just amazing the difference. You know, I mean, the quality is driven into large scale production. Quality is sort of a, of a secondary, you know, thought. You know, for the small people, they're they're just trying to get the the main thing sewn. You know, and so they don't necessarily have somebody who sews it and somebody who's, you know. And doing a full inspection on it, and then sending it back in the line, inspecting it again, sending it back in line, make sure everything comes out clean. If you have any feedback, questions, or suggestions, why not drop us a line either on Facebook or directly to our email address info at theoutdoorstation.co.uk. The home of UK based audio and video podcasts for outdoors people everywhere. That's certainly interesting. I mean, I, I've experienced exactly the same thing here with uh, some of the things that we have manufactured, made in in the UK. Um, the companies start off full of enthusiasm with the best of intentions. The first few batches come out fantastic, and then things start to slip. and 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 if they have a turnover of staff as well, it's very very hard to you know uh, build a relationship up with somebody that who's going to look after your interests from that point of view. And I totally agree with you about products arriving and they still need packaging and they still need wrapping and they still need all the additional things that go with them. Uh, and and that's a job that you think you're saving money on, but in actual fact. You know, your time is money as well, so it is it is costing money at the same time. Do, do you um, did you have a? I mean, was it a big issue for you to find a, a quality partner in Asia or overseas to to work with? I mean, there's such a vast country and there's so many people producing things. It must be um, a, a real minefield to to find somebody. Well, I think that's where you know. Fortunately, there are still you know. There's so many contacts in this this market. We've been extremely lucky from day one. I mean, um, there, I, I met um, some people, you know, who were basically started, you know, the same level I did with an idea, got got into it, and then I made good friends with them, and you know, and as they grew and went in through the, through the the hassles of trying to find production capabilities both in the U.S. and then also in Asia. You know, they were able to, you know, 
basically negotiate the, the the minefield in advance, and then you know I came along afterwards, and they gave me contacts and gave me all kinds of information. Um, so they, in, a, in many ways, they sort of plowed the field um, for me. So it was much easier for me to go in and 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 talk to somebody who had you know established um, production. Um, and as opposed to basically just going over there and trying to say, okay, you know, there's 15 people who could do it, you know, um, who's going to be the best, you know, and that's, that's a much more difficult to thing. And I, it took me, I think five years to make the switch before we even, or to, to basically first contacts meetings, you know, and then we also wanted to make sure we were, you know, stable enough as a company because, you know, when you go to China, you know, you're going much larger quantities, you know, the bills get, you know, much bigger. Yeah. That's... Even though your cost per item is reducing, you're producing a lot more items. So, you know, there's a certain fear factor in that from a small um, business point of view. And it's it's a shame, isn't it? Really, that that the nations that we're talking about, the US and the UK. I mean, our manufacturing base. Um, I've had this conversation with, with several people. Uh, it's always the same. It's it's just, we seem to be very good at at design and coming up with a, a handful of items that we can produce on a short run basis. And um, but we don't really want to go for ten thousand at a time with a with the Asian sort of uh, production. But finding somewhere in between that will produce a thousand or a couple of thousand. Um, mm-hmm. is, is this this vast hole? Is this, is this obviously the same in the U.S. as well? It is, and um, there is a, a movement in the U.S. to bring more production capacity here. And um, I was talking to, you know, one of the, the larger, you know, companies uh, last year in, in April, and and they were actually producing, uh, building a $30 million um, facility in the United States for production purposes, you know, and I was you know, kind of saying, okay, that's cool. I mean, you know, are you going to open it up because they have their own, you know, production line? Or are you going to, you know, expand that facility to do, you know, contract selling for, you know, other people? Because I know a lot of cottage industry people would like to have an established company like that in the U.S. they could go to. Mm. They had all the stuff in place, people who actually knew what they were doing, you know, as opposed to, you know, walking into some shop someplace and the person is essentially sewing their gear in the garage, you know. And um, and they said, well, it's for already, you know, capacity purposes and, and we're, we're selling our goods in Asia, you know. <laughs> so it's one of those, you know, it's not even, they're not even selling their, their stuff in the U.S. The stuff they're making in the U.S. is because they're selling it to Asia because Asia wants U.S. produced goods. And they were already um, at capacity, and they're already at capacity, and they're, so they're not interested in in in, um, in having other people come in. Which just goes to show <coughs> the demands there, doesn't it? It's ridiculous that uh, that more people aren't aren't t- taking this on board. I, I've, there's certainly been a, a few t- a bit of a talk uh, in the um, uh, some of the uh, outdoor industry here, uh, some of the people on the sidelines about it's about time we because all our our um, older um, skill set um, machinists, so machinists mm-hmm. um, engineers, tool makers designers, they're all, uh, have either retired or they've been, you know, the company's come to a close and there's nothing right. else for them. That, that skill, that knowledge that understanding of materials um, that they work with on a daily basis ever since they were a young apprentice is evaporated and I think it, that's the shame, that's the shame of it all to see that, um, that disappear uh, and as you say, it's great to say let's start a uh, sort of a local fabrication unit going again, but you suddenly realise that the knowledge that you need to make the best of whatever purchases you you put in place, whatever equipment you put in place, is actually um, dying out sadly. Right now, there are you know, I mean, there are people in in this cottage industry who do all their production in house, you know, and um, but the the problem I think. And generally, yeah, it depends upon you know, if you look at the the owners of them. They're generally younger people, and they're, you know, I'm, I was when I started, I was too old to want to get into the point where I was going to manage a lot of people for production purposes, and then, and then you got to learn about all the production capable things to to do that. And so there's a certain amount of thinking. I'm, I'm I want to concentrate on, you know, the customer and the gear, and not concentrate on building a production facility, you know. Um, 
But if you're younger, and some of the younger people are producing in the house, whether or not they will continue to do that, you know, will be interesting to see over the next five, ten years. The people who have done that in the past, people like um, Granite Gear, did all all their production in house in the U.S. for for a number of years. Um, Arcteryx, um, they're out of uh, Canada. They did all their production here, but then they've also moved all of their stuff to Vietnam in the last five years. So, you know, the question is, as one of these smaller places that are doing in-house production, when they get up to to the quantities, they get up successful and they get up to the quantities, whether or not they can actually handle that, you know, in-house will remain to be seen. An interesting place to stop there. And more can be heard, of course, in part two, which will be released in a few days. My thanks to Ron Moak at Six Moon Designs for taking the time and sharing his thoughts on this wide and varied topic. Of course, all links can be found over on the Outdoor Station, along with the ability to leave a comment and any contribution you may wish to make on the subject. As I say, part two is due to be launched shortly, followed by further interviews on the subject with Henry Shires and Glenn Van Pesky of Gossamer Gear. So until next time, folks, take care out there and enjoy the beginning of 2013. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear more from our extensive free library, please visit the website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk, the home of UK-based audio and video podcasts for outdoors people everywhere.